Okay. Hello. Um, so, um, there's basically three things I want to talk about today. Um, one is judgments, a lot called judgments. It's kind of what other people call opinion. Um, or maybe I should say rational opinion. Uh, no, I think it just means opinion. That's so judgment can be correct or well, done correctly or incorrectly. Um, second is about uh, how knowledge can be extended. Um, and there's basically three ways knowledge can be extended. It can be extended by reason. It can be extended by instructions. And then, Musili. Pessoal, o que é de máscara? Essa aula é ao vivo? Pai, sim. O que é de máscara? Não. Não sei nada como é que fala. Eu acho que eu sou normal. Well, um, and uh, kind of a third, I can put a question mark after it. We'll see what lots of analysis of it is. Faith, can knowledge be extended by faith? Um, and then the third thing, as usual, I don't know if I'll get to the third thing. I guess we're starting Barkley. If I don't get to, to something, I'm going to get to it. But, um, I want to talk about the three cases of knowledge of existence. Knowledge of my own existence, the knowledge of existence of external things, and the knowledge of the existence of God. Okay, so I'll start with this one. Um, Breath. So as I think I, did I say this last time? I must have said it, right? That as Locke uses the term, knowledge always involves first. Um, it always involves certainty because it's the perception of the agreement and disagreement there is between our ideas. And we can't be wrong about whether I, I, ideas agree or disagree with each other. Um, well, we can't misperceive whether they agree or disagree with each other. No? That is, if we perceive the two ideas agree with each other, then they do agree with each other. <laughs> right? So, um, um, so, like, things that we know, right, this is that judgment is opposed to knowledge, the way a lot of uses it. The things that we know are things that um, um, that they were certain in a very strong way are true. That is not just that we don't have a reason to doubt them, but that we do kind of somehow perceive that they're true, and so they they must be true. Um, and therefore, given that very strict standard for what counts as knowledge, there isn't very much knowledge, <laughs> right? Like most of the things that we ordinarily would say we know, according to Locke, we don't really know. Um, so, you know, Locke says, like, as I am sitting here writing this on this paper by myself, I consider it very probable that other human beings exist, but I don't know it because there's no one else with them. Which I mean, it's kind of weird when you think about it. So he's he's writing. I guess it's not that weird. I mean, he says it's very very highly probable and probable enough to direct his conduct in every way. But still, I mean, it's kind of interesting that the time when he's writing is a time when 
He's not sure there are any readers. Um, but okay, never mind that. So, um, um, so therefore, Locke says, I mean, since knowledge, although it's great that we have it, we don't have very much of it. We also have this other faculty for um, assenting to propositions in order to use them to guide our actions. And this other faculty is called judgment. So this is like not what Descartes means by judgment and not what Kant means by judgment. I don't know exactly where this use of judgment comes from, actually. I don't know of anyone else other than Locke who uses it this way. But that doesn't mean there aren't other people. It just means I don't know who they are. But anyway, so, um, so he's, as I said, he's using judgment to mean um, basically what other people mean by opinion. And sometimes Locke does call it opinion. But the official term for it is judgment. This is the definition. It's uh, book four, chapter 14, section three on page 576. Um, the faculty which God has given man to supply the want of clear and certain knowledge in cases where that cannot be had is judgment, whereby the mind takes its ideas to agree or disagree or which is the same, any proposition to be true or false without perceiving a demonstrative evidence in the proofs. Um, so, you know, and therefore, uh, because judgment basically means opinion, Locke makes the old uh, platonic distinction from the Mino between um, knowledge and right opinion, only in Locke, it's the distinction between knowledge and right judgment, right? So right judgment is when we do this and we turn out to be correct. <laughs> so we don't know that it's true, but it is true. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, like, this is almost as good as this, as Socrates and Mino kind of decide. Um, but uh, um, but it's not as good as this because we don't have a demonstration to tie it down, as they put it. Right. So it's like um, not. It doesn't have as much social utility as knowledge. I think is the way Locke understands. Whether that's the way Socrates understands that, I don't know. But anyway, that, so that, I think that's the way Locke understands that. So, um, so and I think that explains why Locke, although you know, this is this is mostly what has to guide our actions directly. Um, he's more interested in this. <laughs> He's more interested in knowledge because I think this is what he thinks is really the most valuable when you can get it. Um, but um, um, Locke says, and this I think I've alluded to this before, um, but this is where he says that. And it's important always to keep it in mind that. Well, I guess where he actually says it is in the chapter on reason, which is maybe that was chapter 14. What's the chapter titled Reason? No, it's chapter like 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. Yeah, chapter 17 is the chapter on reason. Locke says, you know, um, uh, Reason is the faculty we have of arranging our ideas in the right order, either for demonstration or for um, like probable argument. Right? He says reason has much to do in either one. Right? So just as we reach knowledge by using reason to form correct demonstrations, or at least that's one way to reach knowledge. 
we reach um, judgments. Now, and now, like, you might also call this right judgment, but that's not actually how Locke defines right judgment, nor is it how uh, Socrates defines right opinion in the New Latino. But you might say the, the, the judgment that whether it's true or not is the right one for us to, us to reach. The conclusion that given our information is most rational for us to reach. Um, uh, reason is going to help us reach that kind of conclusion by telling us how to make probable connections between us. Um, so, I mean, I guess what's important here is that, um, and Locke doesn't explain exactly how this, well, actually, he does kind of explain at length in part that I didn't assign, but, <laughs> um, but, but the explanation isn't that precise. Like exactly how this works, what reason tells us to do when we have ideas that we don't perceive agreement or disagreement between? How how to judge whether it's probable that they agree or disagree? Uh, but um, um, it's not like it's, the fact that it's not knowledge but is merely opinion doesn't mean that we're just guessing, or at least we shouldn't be. Right. Rather, we should be weighing up the evidence. And basically, Locke says, you know, we need to weigh uh, what's been common in our own experience against uh, what's been generally common in our own experience against what uh, trustworthy witnesses say about a particular incident. Um, so, uh, so it's. Um, the combination of a kind of induction based on my own experience and checking that against what other people say. That, um, that's what reason tells us to do here. And if um, we do that correctly, then it's probable that we're right, even though it's not certain. Um, Okay, I think that's all I want to say about judgment. Are there questions about, I mean, that it's going to come up in other, it's already come up and it's going to come up again in other contexts, but I think that's all there is to say about it on its own. Oh, first, there how many of you, yeah, if you need to find me, I'm up here. If you need me to tell you who's around, I can tell you. Oh, that's my problem, yeah. Everything tonight. Yeah, yeah I'm good. I'm all, I get all clapped. While I'm at it, I'll turn off the join and leave soon. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about extension of knowledge. Um, and first about, as I said, there's three ways to do it. Um, but um, the other two kind of come back to the first one, and the first one is to use your reason. Um, So, uh, how do we improve our knowledge by reason? Um, so, like the main way is by demonstration. And a demonstration works when we, I mean, I say the main way, there's really two cases. One is demonstration, and the other one, which in some ways comes first, is intuition, right? Which I'm not sure, I, I think what counts, I mean, this is a way, first of all, of extending your knowledge, according to Locke. Intuition is when you have two ideas and just by considering them next to each other, you can see their speed. You're not really seeing, right? <laughs> uh, you can see their agreement, disagreement, or disagreement. 
Um, and then, uh, and the reason I say, like I emphasize this is a way of extending your knowledge. You might think that like, since these are kind of self-evident, you kind of already know them. But that's not true, right? According to Locke, you can't know something until you actually compare the ideas. And before you know, before you do that, you have to uh, you have to acquire the ideas. If you don't already have the ideas, you can't know it at all. You have to acquire the ideas, and then you have to actually consider them next to each other, next to each other, <laughs> right? Like at the same time, I guess that means, and then you can see. They are, well, but it means more than just at the same time, as you can see from the example I'm, I'm going to give. So, I mean, whether to call that a use of reason or not, uh, I don't know, but it's part of the rational procedure of extending your knowledge. So, like, for example, you know, um, if you have two right angles, so traditionally, this doesn't count as an angle, like what we call 180 degrees. And you can see why it doesn't have a vertex, right? So it's like a degenerate case of an angle. But anyway, so but so they always talk about two right angles. And in fact, uh, Euclid's definition of a right angle is basically um, when two lines meet them at the same angle on both sides, the right angle. So, um, so anyway, if you have two right angles, and then you draw some other lines here through this point, and you uh, you, you look at these three angles, then it's intuitively certain that these three angles are equal to these two angles, according to law. And it's because, I mean, I guess maybe if I drew them separately, it would be easier to understand. Like, here's two right angles. Here's a straight line where I've drawn some other arbitrary lines intersecting. These three angles are equal to these two angles. And Locke says you can know that intuitively because you can actually bring them together and compare them. Right, so that's why I say it's more than the same time. It's like you do in the case of ideas like this, which are ideas of spatial figures, this is literal. You actually like somehow bring them on top of each other to the comparison. And then it's intuitively certain that these two angles are equal to these three angles. So demonstration, though, is when you have two ideas where uh, you can't do that with them, and so you can't tell intuitively whether they agree or disagree. And this is where Locke's example that he comes back to, he comes back to other related examples too, um, over and over of the um, um, theorem that the interior angles of the triangle are equal to two right angles. Right, so if you add up these three angles, it will be equal to adding up these two angles. Now, and Locke says, you can't compare these directly. Right, like no matter how you move and rotate this triangle, you can't make these three angles sit against this line. So a demonstration then is supposed to provide like intermediate steps where there's some angles you can compare these three to, and then you compare those angles to these two. And you know, it's basically right. So what you do is draw a line parallel to the base through the vertex. And now this is the part I've been trying to understand for a long time, how long things works. The how how Locke thinks we can demonstrate this, but like I mean, we know at least it's a theorem that this angle is equal to this angle. Since those are parallel lines. The question is, does Locke think that's intuitively certain, or do there have to be more steps in the? Not sure. 
This, this, by the way, is pretty much the way Euclid proves it. It's that's like shifted around a little bit. So it's basically the same proof, right? And then we know this angle is equal to this angle. So these three angles are intermediates because we can compare them to the three angles of the triangle. But then we can compare them to these two right angles, and that's the end of the demonstration. Yeah. So a demonstration just takes some sort of like, I don't know, complicated thing and then breaks down until it's intuitively like understandable. Well, it's, I mean, it's not really breaking down that's going on here, yeah. although that might be involved in some demonstration that burns a lot. Of it. But it's, it's just, it's finding intermediate steps. I guess, I guess, well, what, I guess it depends what you, what you mean by breaking down, but it's like, yeah, in a sense, we're breaking down the relationship between these two angles and these three angles into steps. Mm -hmm. And at each step, we have to have intuitive knowledge. But we're not breaking down these angles, right? We're finding three other angles that we can put in between them. So, right, so he thinks of it as like, the way the demonstration works is, you know, like what you want to demonstrate is that S is P, but, or that S is equal to P in this case, right? This is, this is the second type of knowledge that what the law calls relation, right? It's not identity. We're not proving that these three angles are the same as these two angles. That could be we're proving that they're equal to them, that they're they're similar to them in some respect. Yeah. So it's just like proofs. Yeah, it's proofs, but I'm trying to explain how Locke thinks a proof works. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's somewhat because it's different than the way we nowadays usually think about proofs. Right. So like he doesn't think of the proof as uh, a bunch of. I mean, it's different from the way Aristotelians think about true proofs too, and he criticizes them. We, we don't, he doesn't think of a proof as a bunch of premises that you write down and then you have rules by which you can generate other propositions and then you get to the conclusion. It's, this is the conclusion. And the problem is to find things to put in between to make it intuitive. So, you know, we say like e equals S2 equals, and we can fill in all these steps, then the conclusion of the proof is that this equals that. Yeah. I was confused because he talks about how each intermediate step requires, not just requires, but involves intuitive knowledge. But right before that, he talks about how it's not as certain as intuitive knowledge. So I didn't understand why the certainty, why why uncertainty is created if there's intuitive steps at every step of the proof. It's um it's a problem. We'll see Hume actually using that to okay. cast doubt on. But it's, but I mean, I think I sort of understand what Locke's what Locke is is thinking. He's, it's it's. I mean, first of all, he says it's not as certain. I mean, that's weird because he's, they're both absolutely certain. So how can one be less certain than the other one? But still, I mean, there's there, but there's an issue here that there isn't in the in one step. Which is that you have to remember all the steps and what order they went. And you know, Locke thinks uh, um, as we'll see, if and when we get to knowledge of existence, right? Locke says, like, just as I know of the existence, present existence of things by my senses, so I know the past existence of things by my memory. Right? So, like memory is. Um, as long as it lasts, is as good as sense, according to law. Um, and in this case, presumably, we're not talking about sense. Memory is as good as intuition, right? But the problem is that memory tends to decay. So as long as the memory is still there, okay. But as it decays, and like, I don't know, that means you have a harder time recalling it, or you more easily... You lose some of the details of it, maybe, uh, as it decays. So, like, at some point, when you reach the end of a long proof, you may not be sure you remember all the stuff in between. Um, or maybe hard to remember them. And I think that's supposed to be the difference. And, I mean, you can see why, if it's just one step, there's nothing to remember, so it hasn't started yet. 
problem hasn't started yet. But the whole thing is in front of me, and there's nothing going on. Um, and um, and the point of this is to extend our knowledge. So, I mean, maybe that sounds kind of obvious. So, I mean, that is, okay, first of all, this is a way we can extend our knowledge, frankly. That part is kind of obvious. It, it's possible to do this. It's a way to extend your knowledge, right? Like, we didn't know if those angles were the equal to those angles. You could go through the proof and then you would know. Um, um, but it also seems like Locke thinks that um, um, well, there's a couple things. First of all, in his discussion, he seems to assume that we start out knowing what are the two ideas that you want to uh, show that they agree or disagree. We're just looking for the right intermediate ideas to do it. Um, so, uh, there's a certain kind of process involved in the extension of knowledge that Locke isn't talking about. But also the other thing that I was going to say is that uh, he seems to assume that this is the only use of demonstration. Um, assume or seems to think that, that there are no other uses of demonstration. Meaning that like if I already know something, then searching for a demonstration of it is a waste of time because I already know. Um, I mean, it's possible that he doesn't say this. I think maybe he would admit that if I find a shorter demonstration, that would be good because it'd be easier to remember, but he doesn't even say that. Um, uh, and you know, maybe you think that's not important because if you remember way back, I don't remember where this was, but maybe it wasn't that way back. Maybe this was the beginning of book four, where he says, you know, I used to think he distinguishes between um, uh, when we know something by demonstration. There's two cases. One is that I can call up the whole demonstration whenever I need it. The other is that I can remember that I had a demonstration, but I can't remember all the stages of the demonstration. And Locke says, I used to think that that second case was inferior, but now I realize that it's just as good because the way it works is, this is where the, reliability of, or not even subject to question about reliability of memory comes in. I remember that I perceived a dis an agreement before those between those ideas in the past. I don't remember the steps I used, but I remember that I perceived it. And I also know that if those ideas agreed in the past, they still agree now, because we're not talking about the type of thing that can change. And therefore, I still have a demonstration whenever I want to. Right? It's just perceived by a different path. So anytime, so like, so like originally I wanted to know if these three angles are equal to these two angles. And I was able to fill in these intermediate steps and become certain that they are. Now, when all I have to do is remember that I was certain and add in the how to draw this on the intermediate idea is not so clear, but somehow I add in there the fact that if I was once certain, it's then I could be certain now too. And now I'm certain. <laughs> All right, so anyway, why was I saying that? Uh, um, oh, because I was saying, so maybe he doesn't think it's important to find a demonstration that's shorter and easier to remember. Once you've done the demonstration once, at least as long as your memory that you were certain lasts, you don't need any demonstration. Uh, I don't know. 
How about if your memory goes away, then you might be remember, able to remember the steps. In any case, like I said, he doesn't talk about that. And he certainly doesn't talk about other purposes for finding a demonstration, and, like trying to understand why something is true. Right? Like I know it's true, but I don't know why. So I want to find a proof. That that doesn't make sense to him. Yeah. Um, what well, something's intuitive is it in a sense inherently correct? Like you don't need to prove that it's just right because it's like it just makes sense. Well, I mean, yeah, so if it's intuitive, it means you know it just by inspecting, he doesn't use the word inspecting. Okay. But just by perceiving the two ideas, you know for certain that they agree or disagree. Um, so, so according to, to Locke, a proof is not necessary. And also for the reason I was just saying, a proof is pointless, right? If something is intuitively certain, then you know it just by thinking about it. And so looking, you don't, and the purpose of a proof is, you know, Locke's, Locke actually says at the beginning of every proof, the conclusion is in doubt. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for a proof, <laughs> right? So if you're certain about it right away, then, then a proof is like, has no point. Yeah. Is it like then impossible for something intuitive to be like, like wrong? Like what I'm what I'm asking is if you have a proof, could it be then possible later on for that proof to be proven wrong? Like, or is there there? Well, you know, so I mean this is related to what you're asking also. Uh like and it's another thing that you was gonna bring up in the same con Connection, you know, like Hume is going to say, like, okay, when a mathematician proves something, do they say, okay, now I know it? No, they check their proof and then they show it to other people and then they publish it and see if anyone has an objection, whatever. Right. So um, um, it's not clear how Locke can account for that. Um, I mean, I think I know roughly how he would account for it, but I'm not sure that he, you know, like, so first of all, he would have to say something like, it happens when you've thought about the words rather than the ideas, right? Similar to, we didn't talk about this, but I didn't get to it, but he says that confusion of ideas is always merely verbal, right? So like, if I have two ideas, and I'm, I'm actually, like, I actually have those two ideas in my mind. Um, there's no way I can confuse one with the other. They're different. Um, that is, every perception of an idea is a perception of exactly what that idea is and not anything else. So then Locke says, well, why is it that we talk about having confused ideas? He says, it's because we have words where it's not where we haven't fully decided what idea they go with. So I think he would say that, I, I'm gonna to get to you in a second. I, I think he would say that, that something like that happens when we make a mistake in a proof, probably. That's also why he says that a proposition like, all gold is yellow. Why this is trifling. Because if you know what these, and so assuming yellow is part of the definition of gold, if you know what these ideas are, then um, um, then you don't add anything to the idea of gold that you already have in your mind by saying it's yellow. You're already thinking in yellow. Right, so this is as opposed to Kant saying that an analytic judgment can form a can have a purpose of like clarification, because Kant is following Leibniz and thinking we really do have ideas or concepts or whatever that are confused and they need to be clarified. Locke is thinking that 
if we really have them, they can't be confused and there's no need to clarify them. And so it, it's not like this is like, again, it's just playing with words basically. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's intuitively known that it's like, I know like they read it intuitively, but it's like straight up uh, something that's intuitive and complicated. There aren't supposed to be degrees. Uh, I mean, there may be some places where lock. And, you know, as I was saying, there aren't really supposed to be degrees of certainty, but then sometimes he says that some two things are certain and one's more certain than the other. <laughs> um, but yeah, as far as I can understand, there, there, there aren't um, intuitive knowledge is absolute. You know, like, um, yeah, it's compared to perception, but of course, perception isn't that reliable. Like the sense perception, right? So it's better than perception. Um, it's again, I think it has to do with the, with the thought that there can't be anything hidden about an idea when it's in your mind. You know, like if it's in your mind, it's there. Um, and so if you perceive its connection to another idea, um, that, that connection is there. And you know, notice that these demonstrations, right? Like these demonstrations are possible because we're talking about primary qualities and this necessary connection. I said this before, right? Um, somehow there's also demonstrations possible in ethics. Those demonstrations involve the existence of God as like as one of the intermediate ideas, I believe. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how that fits into what type of necessary connection there is. There. I think, I think those demonstrate. So, so like, what is the synthetic a priori element in ethics? To use Kantian terminology, I think according to Locke, it's not a um, proposition. That we know, but it's rather the effect that pleasure and pain has on our will. That somehow that's what allows non trivial demonstrations in ethics. And that is like certain and constant, as we can in uh, book one. All right, but anyway, uh, um, the when he gives examples of demonstrating things in ethics, they're not very good. They sound kind of trifling, actually, right? Like one example he gives is without property, there is no theft or something like that. Um, it sounds like that's about definitions. Uh, I guess maybe like you have to understand under property, like the, the law. Right, property is is the law that you can't interfere with someone else's rights. Um, the law law is just a demonstration, then. Well, no, I'm saying that like like that's because the question is when I demonstrate when I demonstrate that without property there is no theft. Where does the existence of God and reward and punishment and all that stuff come into it? But if it doesn't, it sounds like I'm just playing with definition. Which again, Locke thinks is pointless. Although you know, not everyone would agree with him that that's pointless. But he thinks that's pointless. So you know, so why is he giving pro without property? There is no theft as an example. So I was trying to say that pro that, that it's that the like all that extra stuff is kind of hidden in the word property. Something like that. I don't know. Never mind. If that. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, <laughs> um, right, and you know, I mean, this is why he also criticizes the theory of the syllogism, um, which is that, right, the whole um, like machinery of Aristotelian logic, where if you want to prove that S is P, you would, I mean, so they agree that the conclusion 
they're usually thinking about identity. They're not equality. Let's, you know, anyway. So they agree that the conclusion has two terms, and the two terms are what we're trying to connect in the syllogism. And you, you know, but the syllogism and the syllogism involves, does involve an intermediate term. But the intermediate term, you know, call it X. So the, right, so like the two premises of the syllogism are going to be S is X, X is P, and the conclusion is going to be S is P, right? Like, um, um, I guess you write it together. Yeah, I think I read the premises. There's actually some effectiveness in about what you But anyway. Right, like if I want to show that all humans are mortal, I could show, I could, the premises might be all animals are mortal, all humans are animals, therefore all humans are mortal. So Locke says, like all this extra stuff doesn't like help you extend your knowledge. And it's just easier to write to write it like this. <laughs> what do you need all that extra stuff for? But you know, the truth is, like I think um, Aristotelians, like contemporary logicians, whatever the other differences between them may be, they're they're not studying it basically in order to prove things better. Right? They're like once you take pill nine, you don't become able to prove things better. It's they're studying it because they want to understand something about what proof is. That's why Aristotelians are interested in silicon. Um, and again, Locke kind of discounts that. Like the purpose, you know, proof is for extending your knowledge and not for like thinking about or using for anything else. Um, okay, so that's extension of your knowledge by reason. It's, you know, the main examples it talks about our demonstration, but every demonstration involves intuitive connections. Otherwise, it's no good. Right? Like these, this has to be intuitive, and this has to be intuitive, or there's no demonstration. Um, so, as I said, the next one is instruction and it basically has the same parts as this um right that is it basically works the exact same way Locke talks about them together book four chapter eight section three on page five 40. Um, instruction lies in something very different. This is right after he talks about how pointless syllogisms are. Instruction lies in something very different. And he that would enlarge his own or another's mind to truths he does not yet know must find out intermediate ideas and then lay them in such order one by another that the understanding may see the agreement or disagreement of those in question. Propositions that do this are instructive, right? So like, so the way to en enlarge your knowledge by instruction is to have someone else find out this order for you and put it down in the right order and then you so this goes, remember, with his with his theory about the use of language, right? I, you know, like the teacher has the ideas in the right order. This is harder, of course, right? I mean, it's like Locke says there's different levels of of ability to prove something. The highest level is. When you find out the ideas yourself for the first time, no one else has ever found intermediate ideas like this. Um, the 
Next level is that you're like able to remember and produce the ideas that someone else has laid out. And the lower level is just that you're able to follow when someone lays out the ideas. <laughs> um, and you know, at least that's what instruction first achieves. Although hopefully eventually you'll get to the next level to the higher level of being able to reproduce it yourself. But it's just like so I can get you to perceive the agreement, the disagreement there is between the three interior angles of the triangle, the two right angles, by showing you the intermediate steps. And then if you didn't know it before, now you'll know it. Um, and of course, uh, since instruction involves demonstration, also, instruction must involve intuition. Um, and um, I think uh, Locke agrees that you can also be instructed in intuitive truths. That might seem like that might seem weird, right? Like it's intuitive. Why do you need someone to instruct you? But the point is that, um, again, you, it's intuitive if you put the two ideas together and consider them together. But if you've never done it, you don't know. And so, um, like, um, I can instruct you that these three angles are equal to these two angles. Um, because even though supposedly, as soon as you understand what these two figures are, um, you'll, you know, um, you can tell that, that there's that equality. Um, you know, like infants and savages and whatever, I've never considered these figures. Someone has to tell them. Or they have to, to do it themselves, right? But if they don't do it themselves, someone can tell them, hey, consider these two figures, and then they'll see that they're equal. Um, and I think actually Locke talks about doing this, this kind of intuitive. I mean, it's implicit in the idea that, that instruction works by demonstration, right? Because again, every step of the demonstration is intuitive. But I think Locke actually talks about this um, uh, instruction that only tells you something you can know by intuition. This is back in book one. I don't know how important this is, but oh well. <laughs> um, Um, so it's uh, book one, chapter two, section 21 on page 68. But we have not yet done with assenting to propositions at first hearing and understanding their terms. Just fit we first take notice that this, instead of being a mark that they are innate, is a proof of the contrary, since it supposes that several who understand and know other things are ignorant of, these, ignorant of these principles till they are proposed to them. And one may be unacquainted with these truths till he hears them from others. For if they were innate, what need they be proposed in order to gaining assent? Um, et cetera, et cetera. If so, then the consequence will be that a man knows them better after he has been thus taught them than he did before. Whence it will follow that these principles may be more made more evident to us by others' teaching than nature has made them by impression, which will ill agree with the opinion of innate principles. So, right, the point is that like our knowledge that it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be, for example, um, can't be innate because, like, you know, so what his opponents say is, well, it's innate in the sense that we assent to it as soon as it's proposed to us. And Locke says, you assent to it as soon as it's proposed to it, that shows that someone taught it to you. 
by proposing it. <laughs> and then you knew it better than you did before, which will ill agree with the opinion of innate principle. Um, right, so, so that which is certainly an intuitive truth, it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. Um, that type of thing, Locke is saying, yes, you need to be taught that because someone needs to propose it to you. I mean, or you may need to be taught it, right? I mean, obviously, again, you could have figured it out by yourself. Where figure it out means, like, in the case of an intuitive truth, figuring it out is not a process. You just have to decide to compare those two ideas. Yeah. I guess I'm struggling to understand how instruction works to, like, Still, an, an intuitive idea in someone else because he, you know, like he says, like examples of intuitive ideas: a circle is not a square, a black is not white. So, like, what's being added in the instruction? That is it like a new combination of in, of intuitive things that the the, the the pupil already knows that are somehow being arranged such that they can. You know what I, I just yeah I'm so unclear. so like the identity and difference ones are going to be hard to catch because um, because uh, like all I have to do is kind of like while you're seeing something white remind you of something black and you'll see that, that they're not that they're different right. But that still has to be done, right? Like if you've never compared white and black, you don't know for the lot that white is not black. Um, so, and like if you've never tasted a pineapple, then you don't know that the taste of a pineapple is not black. <laughs> I mean, that example is kind of weird, right? You don't know the taste of pineapple is not a color. <laughs> Maybe you somehow do know that because of the definition of taste and color, which is which are weird anyway. But um, so, uh, but anyway, you don't know the taste of pineapple is not the taste of a lemon if you've never tasted a pineapple. So, like, I can teach you that the taste of a pineapple is not the taste of a lemon by giving you pineapple. <laughs> right. But, but but it's easier to understand in a case like this, right? Like, you may never have thought of these ideas together. You may never have thought of these ideas at all, right? Like, you know, when Socrates teaches Nino, and obviously there's like, there's a huge question in that dialogue, whether Socrates, and in all dialogues, whether Socrates is teaching or not teaching or whatever. But when Socrates does what we would normally call teaching Nino, <laughs> that the, uh, that the square on the diagonal is double, the square on the side, right? So that like um, this square has not the really square, but this square has twice the area of this square. Like he does it by, among other things, drawing a. I mean, first of all, like, he tells the slave, "Okay, draw this. Now draw this. Now draw that." Right? So he's inducing to have ideas. And when it comes down to it, Socrates himself draws this line here, right? It's like before, because he asked the slave, what is the side of the double square? And the slave is like guessing, he said, twice the side of the original, one and a half times. Now the slave is able to, to, Socrates is able to convince the slave that those don't work, but the slave doesn't know what to say. And then Socrates says, well, consider this line. So, like, once you consider that line, it becomes, I don't know if this is intuitively certain or if there's a couple of steps inside in, in between, but it becomes certain that, right, this square has four of these triangles and this square has two of them. So, this one has twice the other. But, um, but, someone had, but someone can teach you that. All right. Um, Uh, okay, are there more questions about that? Because if not, I'm going to go on and talk about faith. Not doing that much. 
make it through the proof of the existence of God. No. All right. So I'm going to talk about faith. This is interesting and weird. So, like, when I wrote this as a third source uh, way of extending your knowledge, I put a question mark. Um, so, faith is a way of gaining. Well, at least we think it might be a way of gaining knowledge, although it seems like in the end it turns out to be only probability. But it works by something like instruction. So this is Book 4, Chapter 18, Section 2 on page 608. Um, Faith is the assent to any proposition, not thus made out by the deductions of reason, but upon the credit of the proposer as coming from God in some extraordinary way of communication. This way of discovering truth to men we call revelation. Um, so it sounds like this, right? He says it doesn't proceed by the deductions of reason. Therefore, it's neither this nor is it instruction in this sense, but it's on the credit of the proposer as coming from God. So, right, someone says, um, like, uh, well, Locke says it could be something like this that you could demonstrate. Right? Like God told me that the interior angles of the triangle equal two right angles. By the way, I've probably said this before, but this, you know, the fact that Locke chooses this example over and over is something like, I mean, it has something to do with the weird status of the parallel postulate thing. Like this is, um, this is the known area problem in Euclidean geometry. And sure enough, this is what, once we have non-Euclidean geometry, is like, um, in non-Euclidean geometry, the angles don't add up to the right to left triangle on a sphere. This is the model of a non-Euclidean geometry. You have two right angles here and another angle there. Um, anyway, the other thing. Um, why was I saying that? Oh, because like maybe we would need God to tell us this. Raise this blush. Bible God's friends with it. Anyway, like <laughs> um uh or it could be something that I mean this would obviously be more useful, something you couldn't know by demonstration. Um uh, like Locke's example is that there are um, other finite spirits that are above us in the order of nature, angels, basically, right? So Locke says we can't see them, we, so like we have no, we can't, we can't demonstrate their existence in any way. We have no sense knowledge of them. So how could we know they exist? Well, God could tell us. That would be an example of something you've learned from Revelation. But the thing that's weird about this is that um, notice again the word credit in there upon the credit of the proposer as coming from God. So, like, what's happening here is that, first of all, faith is, um, I mean, he's giving it a special theological definition. But it basically just means trusting someone. And of course, primarily it means trusting God. But if you're not the person who got the revelation, then there's another, at least one other, but probably many other um, steps of trusting someone involved. Right? Because, like, um, so these are the two cases that Locke calls 
Original revelation. And traditional revelation. So original revelation is like, here's the prophet. And God, by some extraordinary means, it's extraordinary because the ordinary way God tells us things is through our reason. But in this case, God tells the prophet by extraordinary means that some, that some proposition is true. And so why does the prophet now believe that the proposition is true? Because the prophet trusts God not to tell them false things. Right? So that's why I say faith just like it just it means having faith in something, like trusting. Um, that's the first case. The second case is, again, is obviously, well, I guess this is obvious. Maybe not everyone would agree with this, but, uh, but uh, uh, it's what we would think of as the more usual case, which is God tells the prophet that a certain proposition is true, and then the prophet tells me that the proposition is true. That's traditional revelation. And of course, normally there'll be lots and lots of steps. <laughs> right? The prophet told someone, he told someone else, he told someone else, he told someone else, blah, blah, blah. Eventually it gets to me. <laughs> um, but you already, you can already see that the issue in this simple case. God told the prophet, the prophet told, told me. Now I have, to, I, there are two trusts that I have to go on here, right? Because I have to trust God to tell me the truth, just the same way the prophet did in original revelation. But I also have to trust the prophet to tell me that God said this. Now, like, why do I trust the prophet? How do I decide whether to trust the prophet? Well, I have to use my reason. <laughs> right? As Locke says, you can't tell me, if I ask you why I have to trust this prophet, you can't tell me that's a matter of faith. Because, I mean, that is, you could, it's, but it's similar to the case of the freedom of the will thing. Maybe you could do it once, but you can't always do it, right? Because they would need an infinite number of prophets. <laughs> like if you want, if I want to know why I should trust this prophet, and you say it's a matter of faith, that's that's amounts to saying that some prophet told me to trust this prophet because God told the second prophet, right? So here's the second prophet. God told the second prophet that this prophet is trustworthy. This prophet tells me that this prophet is right. So obviously, this is going to be a general solution. <laughs> So, um, so I can't. This can't be a matter of faith. So it has to be either demonstration or probable argument. Um, and which is it going to be? Well, like as Locke says. This is book four, chapter 18, section four on page 610. Um, oops, stand on the um, For he has no greater an assurance than that of his senses that it is writ in the book supposed writ by Moses inspired. But he has not so great an assurance that Moses writ that book as if he had seen Moses write it. So that the assurance of its being a revelation is less still than the assurance of his senses. Still, um, this is something that took me a long time to realize. 
still used to mean always. The 17th century still means always. So, Greg, what he's saying is the assurance of its being revelation is less always than the assurance of its sense of it. <laughs> um, and, you know, even if I saw Moses write the book, um, I still have to believe that Moses is telling me the truth when Moses said God told him to write. Um, he doesn't mention that in this passage, but he does mention that in other places, and it's clearly an issue. And how do I know? Well, well I mean, I'm going to have to say, like, in my experience, Moses is a trustworthy guy. Other people have said he's trustworthy. Right? These are the, these, just the regular ways we make problems with Um So... That's why I said to begin with that, first of all, faith is not going to lead to knowledge in Locke's sense. Right? The most it's ever going to get, at least certainly traditional revelation, is not going to get you any higher than probability. Um, But um, what about original revelation? Now, I mean, this is less relevant because most people don't think they have original relevant revelation. <laughs> so, um, but still, like to complete this, you know, discussion, we need to talk about original revelation. Can you get knowledge back? Well, um, Um, the prophet has to know that it's God who's talking to them. Right? I mean, what is this extraordinary way? Like, you you know, see a burning bush and a voice comes out of it, or you have a vision, or, you know, I don't know, something happens, and you have to decide whether God is the origin of I mean, we can suppose there's a demonstration, although Locke doesn't really provide this demonstration. You know, and even Descartes doesn't exactly provide a demonstration. There's something about it. But we suppose there's a demonstration that God would never lie to us. Suppose. And that God can't be wrong about it. So, like, those are the two ways someone could lead you astray when they tell you something. They could be wrong or they could be lying to you, right? So you might think, okay, there's no problem here. But, but there is still a problem because actually Locke says there's two problems. One problem is you have to be sure that it's God who's talking to you. And the other problem is you have to be sure that you understand correctly what God told you. Yeah. Um, I guess... The part that confused me a little bit, it seems like being lied to would still be original revelation. It's, it'd still be the introduction of an idea from an external source that is is not, I guess, perceptive. Oh, yeah. Well, but it, yeah, but it wouldn't be a way of extending your knowledge. It would be a way of, right? I mean, if you were lied to. And so, like, and so if you knew you know, that this revelation comes from a being that sometimes lied to you, that will sometimes lie to you, then you, you know, you wouldn't um, believe the proposition of authority. So, yeah, I guess you could still call that revel. I mean, I don't know, but what does it mean by revelation? Revelation means like revealing. I don't know, like lying is not really. <laughs> but but anyway, the, but the point is, if it's going to be a way of extending your knowledge, you have to you have to believe that the being that's telling you is truthful. Yeah. Um, could it come like in the form of a dream, or? Yeah, it could be a dream. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I would that was basically I was saying the two alternatives I was offering that either you know you could see a physical or you know experience a physical miracle or it comes to you in a dream or a vision. Um, but maybe there's other ways too, but the point is, whatever the way is, 
number one, it's going to have to communicate a proposition to you. So it has to have some kind of like talking aspect to it. And uh, and you have to um, be sure what the source of that is and that you understand it from. Yeah. Would, you, would, would traditional revelation have to come before original revelation because like it like the initial like knowledge would need to be like realized by others in order for you to know that that is knowledge yourself. Uh, are you saying that the prophet, in order to be sure that it's God that's talking to them, has to check with other people? Is yeah. What you're saying? Um, I don't think Locke is thinking that, but it's okay. but like maybe Levin is thinking that. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't think Locke is thinking that. But I mean, this, how would Locke explain the increase in certainty that you get by talking with this other person? Um, I mean, I guess if we're talking about a miracle, you could ask other people if they saw it. But, but like anything like that is only going to be probability, right? Like if, in other words, if it's, I mean, so first of all, that wouldn't really be traditional revelation coming before original revelation, exactly. But it would be like. Yeah, that somehow talking to other people is going to increase the profits. Um, the prophet will attach more probability to this thing that they that they heard, um, but that will never get them to certainty. Yeah. So, if if there is a way to get certainty from original revelation, it's not going to involve this. So, um, but you know. But, but again, I think Locke's point exactly is that it never raises, rises to that level. And that's why he says that um, um, even original revelation can never, so original revelation, Locke says, can or could do things that traditional revelation doesn't. For example, traditional revelation, I can't, if I had a new simple idea that you've never had, I can't. Like if God caused a new simple idea in my mind that you've never had, I can't transmit that to you. You know, which original revelation that could happen. But um, the um, um, but what even re original revelation can't do is um, cause me to know something that goes against the dictates of my reason. Right, so like if a voice comes to, down from heaven and says, you know, two plus three equals four, <laughs> then I have to weigh for myself. Like, I mean, it, I think Locke acknowledges it may be very probable that's a divine voice. I, mean, I don't know exactly how that's established, but I think Locke, at least Locke, Locke can freely give that away anyway, right? It may be, I may be like entitled to think it's very probable that that's God. That's on one side. But on the other side, two plus three is definitely not four. <laughs> that's not probability, that's certainty. So like, however small the chance that either that voice is not God or that I don't understand it properly, it's still higher than the chance that two plus three equals four, right? So, um, so like, so, which basically amounts to saying that original revelation also never rises to the level of knowledge. It's always just probability. It might be very high probability, but you can see the difference in that kind of case where there's supposedly a revelation of something that's contrary to reason. 
Now, I mean, one place this is heading, as usual, if you look in uh, book four, chapter 18, section five, back on page 610, um, the mind has so evident, a uh, let's see, for example, the ideas of one body in one place do so clearly agree, and the mind has so evident a perception of their agreement that we can never assent to a proposition that affirms the same body to be in two distant places at once, however it should pretend to the authority of a divine revelation. Since the evidence, first, that we deceive not ourselves in ascribing it to God, secondly, that we understand it right, can never be so great as the evidence of our own intuitive knowledge, whereby we discern it impossible for the same body to be in two places at once. Right, so as usual, he's thought, thinking about the Eucharist. Right, right? like, um, it doesn't matter how infallible you think the Pope is, or even like if a voice comes down from heaven, it tells you that the same body can be two places at once. Locke says um, that it's still more probable that uh, you're mistaken, that it's not really God or whatever, because it's impossible for the same body to be two places at once. And, Supposedly, that you know is an intuitive truth. Okay, um, but so that's one thing he has in mind. But I think another thing he has in mind is again remember that the 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 um, moral laws, the divine law, is supposed to be demonstrable, right? So, like, if a voice comes down from heaven and says. Um, Go kill those innocent people and take all their stuff. Locke says, you can you say, well, it's highly probable that God is telling me to kill those innocent people and take all their stuff. On the other hand, it's certain that God doesn't want me to kill innocent people and take all their stuff. Therefore, right, that wasn't God or you know, whatever. So um, so the so that's the other thing he's thinking is that. Um, um, this will prevent religion from trying to interfere with morality. Um, presumably, that's more important. Presumably, for Locke, that's more important than some issue about the Eucharist. <laughs> um, uh, maybe he doesn't emphasize it as much because it's like, um, because. A, you know, like any respectable Anglican audience is going to be like, when you give them the Eucharist example, it's going to be like, oh yeah, right, Revelation can never be contrary to Aretha. <laughs> so, like, that's very easy to accept, but then you also, like, by the way, convince them that Revelation can't be contrary to ethics, which is really more important. Um, Now, I mean, there's another issue here. And so there's what Hume is going to do with this. And unfortunately, he's not going to read this part of Hume, but in Hume's essay on miracles, um, he says that, um, so actually, like Hume says that there might be something you could see that would cause you to believe that a miracle has occurred. Um, I mean, you know, to understand what Hume means by that, we'd have to get into the stuff we're going to read in Hume later about in what sense you could believe what you see ever, right? But um, at least according to the ordinary ways we form opinions, you know, like if you see, a, and Hume defines a miracle as a violation of the laws of nature. That's, for example, not at all how Spinoza defines miracle, but never mind. So, right, so Hume defines a miracle as a violation of the laws of nature. And so he says, you know, if you see it yourself, then yeah, you're going to believe it. But suppose someone tells you there was a miracle. So now he says, well, on the one hand, we have the like very low probability that there's been a violation of the laws of nature. In some sense, that's like 
based on the way Hume thinks we form judgments, that's like the lowest possible probability, so, right? And on the other hand, we have the probability that the person telling you this is lying or deceiving themselves out of fanaticism or enthusiasm or whatever. Um, and Hume says, that's not a low probability. That happens all the time. <laughs> That's actually a really high probability. <laughs> and so he says that um, you can like you can never be given testimony that will cause you to believe that a miracle has occurred. That's his that's Hume's conclusion. Yeah. I feel like that reasoning <clears throat> applies pretty nicely to traditional revelation. Like the probability that someone is crazy is way higher, it seems, than, than being a probability. Um, right, you mean in this simple case of traditional revelation, yeah. right, where you're just judging this, you know, I mean, this person doesn't come out of nowhere and claim to be a prophet, right? I mean, you know, that's like, that's not the story of prophets in the Bible. Well, maybe sometimes it is, but, um, um, but, uh, yeah, I think, but you know, I mean, even more so in the usual case of traditional revelation, right? Where you like, where I mean, you know, that people copy down books and they misattribute them and they have all kinds of interests and views and whatever. And you're like, yeah, that, those things are really likely. Miracle happened, very unlikely, you know. So the question is. The question I was going to raise is Does Locke follow Hume in that? You know, does he really think the traditional revelation? I mean, he's cert that's certainly not what he says. Does, does Locke really think the traditional revelation, at least at many steps removed the way we are, just doesn't, you know, um, never gives much probability at all? Uh, or does he think he has? Or has he not noticed Hume's argument? I mean, that's possible, but what he's saying is so close to it that it's a little hard to believe. But, you know, or does he have some answer to it? But I'm not sure what it would be. Those they, they're two possibilities. I'm not sure which is right. Um, Okay, that's all I want to say about faith. And so, um, all right, I have 10 minutes to talk about knowledge of existence. Better than zero, sometimes happens in two years. Um, this, I'm not sure which is the most important thing to talk about. What knowledge of existence means in general? Well, I mean, okay, so remember way back when in book two, chapter seven, Locke said existence and unity are two other ideas that are suggested to the understanding by every, every object without and every idea within. When ideas are in my, our minds, we consider them as being actually there, as well as we consider things to be actually without us, which is that they exist or have existence. So, um, right, so every time, I said it before, every time I have any idea, it comes, comes in with the idea of existence. You know, so like, here's the idea of existence. Um, so like every idea comes somehow together with the idea of existence. And this existence, this connection means that the idea exists, and that it's object, that it's right. The idea, remember, is the immediate object of my operation, but that the immediate object, the external object, exists. Um, but presumably, this doesn't mean that everything that I have an idea of necessarily exists. Now, um, 
presumably, I mean, that is what Spinoza thinks, right? Spinoza thinks that every idea I have, so every idea I have is an idea of a divine um, attribute of thought, and all of their objects exist. So whenever I have an idea, its object exists. Um, by the way, Spinoza, so Spinoza died in Amsterdam in 1677. Locke arrived in Amsterdam in 1683. So there's like constantly speculation, but I haven't, as far as I'm aware, there's no like real strong evidence, but there's constantly speculation that Locke might have, you know, probably like met people from Spinoza's circle or talked to them or something. But anyway, that's so that's not what Locke thinks. I mean, even Spinoza thinks that what what that that true sub specie eternitatis, right? That like uh, it's true when we look at all things as existing or not, all simultaneously. But it doesn't mean that, that the object of every one of my ideas exists now. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, actually, I think that's kind of like similar to what Locke thinks. As I said before, if this is a simple idea, then um, its object does exist or used to exist, <laughs> right? Because, and again, like how we know this is, is never really we never really resolved how we know this but we know this is like this is what makes Locke an empiricist <laughs> we know that every simple idea if it's not a sensation is a memory right because the mind can't make its own simple ideas so if I have this simple idea now I must have had it in the past as a sensation So its object existed then. So in the case of sensible things, right? So there's three cases, but I don't know if I'm going to get to all of them. Like external objects. That is bodies. Missing from this list is other minds, as it's missing from Descartes' list in the meditations. Although you can maybe gather some things about what Locke thinks about that if you're careful. But you know, number two is myself, and number three is God. So, right, Locke says that I have intuitive knowledge of my own existence. I have demonstrative knowledge or can have demonstrative knowledge of God's existence. And how do I know the existence of external objects? Well, he says he calls it um, sensitive knowledge. And he says it's not so certain as intuition. This is one of the cases where it's weird. Like, what do you mean it's not so certain? And he says it's not so certain as intuition or demonstration, but it's certain enough to be called knowledge. Why he thinks it's not so certain um, that is why is it different from this? So how do I what is what's the source of my intuitive knowledge that I exist? Well, like for example, I'm wondering now whether I exist, right? Or I'm doubting whether I exist. Locke follows Descartes in discussing this um, case, right? So I, you know, um, so that means here's the operation of my mind that doubt. And this operation is reflection. Its immediate object is an idea, the idea of doubt. Yeah. Maybe that's, that's probably a complex idea, but anyway, so 
but you know, um, that is caused in me by the operation of doubt. Maybe that's not a common thing. So this is just like knowledge, and 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 from that I conclude that the subject, the substance in which doubt inheres. The substance that carries out that operation exists. This is just like if I say, you know, I'm looking at a snowball, I have the idea of white. Um, I conclude that the operation of um, looking white. <laughs> Um, exists, and therefore that the substance in which it adheres, the thing that looks white, exists. Right? These are like exactly parallel to each other. So the question is, why is one of them supposed to be more certain than the other? Um, and I'm not sure, but I think um, it's it might have to do actually with the fact that we know so we know more about external objects than we know about ourselves. We know more about them than we know about us. So, like that is, um, because like what's what I directly know here is there's something that can cause me to perceive the idea of what. What I want to know is if it's a snowball. But to know there's a snowball there means knowing something that has certain properties and causes me to perceive the idea of white there. And um, I know some, I know some real properties that a snowball is supposed to have, right? It's supposed to be round and solid. Those are primary qualities. So there's like, um, something I'm actually thinking of under one quality then attributing whiteness to it as well. <laughs> and I can be wrong about that, right? Because, you know, it could be that this is a hologram of a snowball, so it's not solid. Um, whereas in the case of myself, I don't know anything about myself except that I'm the subject of these operations. So I can't be wrong, right? Like I can't, can't turn out it was just a hologram of myself. Because in that case, I would be a hologram. Um, so I, I, but I mean, anyway, this is the best I can do to try to explain this. So, so like the uncertainty in this, it's not that Locke thinks it's uncertain. Locke, I think Locke thinks it's as certain that there's something white as that I equip. But what's uncertain is what the something white is. And but that's the, that's what I'm really trying to know whenever I know about external things. And that's always less certain. Um, or, I mean, I think, it, put it differently, it's like things are either certain or they're not. But this one is a mixture of something certain with something that's not certain. The, the particular idea that, like, if she is a certainty? It's... Sorry, we're over time now, but... I'm saying that, like, what, it, so I guess to put it this way, what I'm certain of is that there's something white there. What I'm not certain of is that it's a snowball. But when I see a snowball, you know, I have sensitive knowledge that there's a snowball there. So that's not like pure, unmixed certainty. Um, I, I, you know, that's the best I can do. It doesn't fit the text very well, so it's probably not. <laughs> And I don't have time to talk about the proof of the existence of God, except I'll just say this is like it has some interesting features, but it's not very innovative. 
um, it's similar to traditional versus just a shot. Um, I'll just I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, 